glad you're here. Those of you who are joining us online, glad that you are a part. We are starting a brand new series this morning um, in which we are looking at the book of Luke. We're going to dive into Luke, and while we won't hit everything in the book of Luke, uh, but we will hit some key moments in the book of Luke, and we're going to study through the book of Luke uh, throughout the entire summer. And so I just want to encourage you, even though we're not going to talk about every single verse, I want to encourage you just to uh, read through the book of Luke yourself. So you can read through the book of Luke. It takes two hours if you read straight through it by the average reader. Or you can uh, take it chunk by chunk, read it over the course of a month, um, or the whole summer, and just kind of reflect on the, the entirety of the book of Luke. But as we begin, we're going to look at Luke chapter 1. We're going to look at four verses this morning, Luke 1, verse 1 through 4. And as we begin, I just want to be honest with you that sometimes um, it's hard for me to understand the Bible, and sometimes it's hard for me to understand Jesus. Anyone else there with me? Sometimes it's just hard to understand the Bible. And I feel like I can be honest with you about that because the Bible is honest about that. Uh, Psalm 145 verse 3 says, Great is the Lord, and he's greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Which means there's things about God that you can search and search, and you will not find. Um, There's things about God that we don't understand, um, but it actually causes us to worship him because he's unsearchable in all his ways. It actually gives us reason to worship him because he is big and we are small. But we also have a God who knows all things and we can look to his heart, his character, and his nature and worship him even though we don't know everything about him. But there are things revealed to us in scripture Um, through his word, that we should know him. There are things that we can have certainty around. And sometimes there's a gap between things that we feel that we should know and things that we do know about God. And it causes tension in us because there's this gap there and we feel like we, we need to know everything. And part of that can probably get closed if we investigate further but then some of the times we won't know and we feel like we should and that tension will be there. And it causes this, that, that tension because we want certainty in everything, but we can't get it in everything. But as we look upon God, we can thank him because we can have certainty around his grace, his mercy, thank him that he saved us. And we can have certainty even though sometimes we don't. Yet we should have certainty in some things, and if we don't have certainty in some things, there is a consequence, and it's not good. Paul describes it like this in Ephesians 4. He says, So that we may not be children any longer, tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes. There's some things we do need to have certainty in, otherwise we will just be thrown around. James says something really similar when he writes that we can ask God for wisdom, and if we come to him without doubt, he'll give it to us. But if we come to God with doubt, then we will be uh, uh, like a child tossed at sea. Like a child tossed at sea. You see these similar things that Paul and James are saying. Like if there are some things that if you don't know, you will be like tossed around like someone at sea. Uh, um, and you, uh, so you kind of get this picture that if you don't have certainty where you should have certainty, it's probably not going to be good for you. Now, anyone ever here uh, gone swimming at the ocean before? It'd be a fun time, right? Anyone ever gone swimming during like a violent storm at the ocean? Probably not many of you because as you look out at the ocean, those of you who've seen it personally or if you've just seen it like in pictures or videos, when there's a violent storm and the sea is just crashing around, it's not only a place that's just not good to swim. You're not intended to swim there at all. You're just not intended to swim because you're going to get thrown up against the rocks, crashed against the reef. You're going to get swept under and you're, you could potentially or probably die if you go swimming in the ocean during a violent storm. You're not intended to swim there. And this image that Paul and James gives us is there is this place that you're not intended to be. And so there are things that if we don't take root and hold of certain things that we can be certain about, you're not intended to live that way. It's not just good for you. God never intended it for you. So let me ask you this. Have you struggled lately to take God at his word? 
Have you battled to believe that God, will he actually fulfill his promises? Or have you ever felt this tension as you look back on your life, however old that you may be, ever struggled to believe like, am I really included in God's family? And if you're questioning things like God's grace that God has for you, and you don't have certainty around that, those are things or places you weren't intended to be. So here's where we'd start with Luke. And Luke is really clear here. Let's read these four verses together, what his desire is. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having followed all the things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty certainty concerning the things you have been taught. There are things that Luke is going to, that writes down, that he's saying these are some of the things that you need to have certainty around. If you don't have certainty around these things, then you might be like what Paul or James says. uh, It's a place you're not never intended to be as a follower of Christ. You will be like the child tossed at sea in the violent storm. And so here, the purpose of today is that I hope that one, that we can have certainty in certain places that God has for us. And I think in the credibility of scripture, certainty within community, and certainty in the centrality of Christ. So let's begin today with this certainty that Luke talks about. We can have certainty through credibility. So first, let's just look at really quickly who Luke is. Luke is an author of the book of Luke and the book of Acts. Now, Luke also doesn't reveal himself like many authors do. Like Paul, he always starts his letters out by saying, I, the apostle Paul, or other gospel writers, you know, reveal who they are. Luke never reveals who he is. But there's plenty of telltale signs to figure out who this author actually is. One is those like we just read in verse four where he uh, presents himself and he says, uh, to the most excellent Theophilus. He also does that in the book of Acts where he presents himself and says, this book is written in part, you know, to the most excellent Theophilus. So you can see that there's these common language that you don't see in the other books at all, that there's this one writer writing to this person and so you see that the, Luke, the book of Luke and the book of Acts were more than likely written by the same person. You also uh, can see this uh, in that early Christian authors um, or early Christian uh, fathers, uh, going back all the way to people like Tertullian, all said that the book of Luke and the book of Acts were written by Luke. Through other telltale signs that m- most, uh, if not all scholars believe that Luke and Acts was written by Luke. Luke. So one was written as a prequel, one was written as the sequel. So Luke was written um, as to be a documentary or a biography of the life of Jesus. Acts was the sequel. It was written to be like a documentary of the formation of the early church. They should be read together, not apart from each other. So you see the beginning story of the life of Jesus, and then the book of Acts is after how the church formed. So Luke, he was not born Jewish. He was a Gentile. Luke was the only uh, author in the Bible that we know of that was not born Jewish. He was the only non-Jewish author in the Bible. He was not a preacher. He was not a teacher. He was not a disciple of Jesus. He was a physician. Luke, we see in the book of Colossians that it says that Luke was a doctor. He was a physician. He was a well-practiced physician. And so he was a highly educated man. And at one point, more than likely, he was a skeptic of Jesus. Being that he was not born into the Jewish faith, he was on the outside and he got converted in some way. And he was a skeptic of what took place or what happened. Luke traveled and interviewed eyewitnesses of those who saw Jesus, was with Jesus, experienced Jesus' ministry, and he created this orderly account, which is the book of Luke. And so he did this with the beginnings of the church and Jesus. He was someone who traveled with the apostle Paul on Paul's ministry, uh, recording the different events. He was probably one of the large benefactors of Paul so that Paul was able to travel and be supported. 
And so this was Luke. Theophilus was probably a new Christian as well, but someone who was in doubt. He was more than likely a Roman. He was not a Jewish person. He was not born a Jewish, Jewish person. He was a Roman and, and really wanted to know, is Jesus really real? And I don't know if you've ever asked yourself that before. Like, okay, I go to church. I hear the things. I was raised. I, you know, I read the Bible here, there. But is Jesus really real? Everything that we hear, is it actually real? Like, does it really uh, mean what it means? This was like Luke, one skeptic writing to another skeptic, Theophilus. This was one person that's like, I want to investigate these claims, and I'm going to write this to you, Theophilus, who was also more than likely a skeptic. And so we see this in verse 1 and 2. Inasmuch as, as many have undertaken to compile a narrative, Luke knows that he's not the only one that wrote a narrative about Jesus. Of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who... Uh, from the beginning were eyewitnesses. These were people who were with Jesus and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. So not only were these witnesses that Luke went and investigated, but these were witnesses who were still around, which is really important because uh, this book was written around 60 AD, which was about 30 years after Jesus' death, which was around 30 to 33 AD which means the window of Luke being able to investigate these claims was closing because some of these people probably had died and there were still some left. And so Luke went to investigate, is this really real? Which means that Luke went to like Bethlehem and talked to people about potentially the birth of Christ. Then he went to places like Capernaum or Jerusalem. He probably went to places like Golgotha, the place of the school where Jesus was crucified. And he asked people, what did you see when Jesus was crucified? What was your story? It means that he probably went and stayed in Peter's home and talked with Peter. Give me your account of what took place. He went and probably stayed in John's home. What happened? What do you think? We know that he read much of Mark's version of the gospel because some of it springboarded off of that, that he probably talked with Mark. You know, what, what happened here? What went on? These are the things that we see that Luke did. So these were witnesses that were still around that Luke went and investigated. Luke had gone off and he met with these high witnesses of Jesus. Some who were for, some who were neutral, and some who were probably against Jesus. And this is Luke's, you know, what he was after is, I don't want to just hear about Jesus. I want to figure it out for myself. I want to investigate for myself. I don't want to just hear about it. I want to find living, breathing people and ask them, what did you see happen? What took place? Who was Jesus? So that I might know Jesus and that I might pass them on to you, Theophilus, or to us. Luke was not the blind faith guy. He was not the blind faith guy. 40% of what Luke writes is not included in the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, or John. And so what Luke does is he goes, I want to know the other 40%. That's what I want to know, which I want to know the finer details. I want to know everything else that's taking place in, this, uh, in the life and ministry of Jesus and in the formation of the church. I want to know the other 40%. This is what Luke's approach was. He wanted to create an accurate and orderly account. Luke has a, a, a solid dose of healthy skepticism so that he might personally investigate them himself. This is Luke's mission. This is Luke's cause. And what Luke concludes is that Jesus was and is the Messiah, the promised one, the one that we have been waiting for. This was Luke's conclusion, and he passed it on to Theophilus and said, read this. It's an orderly account so that you might know yourself. Now, maybe have you ever heard before, gotten an argument with someone that just said, well, the Bible is just a book of contradictions. It always is contradicting itself in different ways. Let me be clear that there's a difference between something being complicated and there being a contradiction. If you want to practice psychology or like my wife, she is um, uh, um, learning and becoming a Christian counselor, you have to train for a minimum of seven years just to insert a little dose of wisdom into someone's life, right? But you could go onto like Facebook or Instagram today and everyone's inserting whatever they want about what the Bible says about 
Not, not uh, matters that contradict each other, but complicated issues. And let me just be really clear that Luke was not the guy who took his wisdom from Facebook or things like that through hearsay, through just one random person's thought or this person's thought. And I want to encourage you, don't live a faith like that either, where you just see stuff, it sounds smart. That is what Paul discouraged again, just cunning uh, behavior or deceitful talk. If you see it, it's like, oh, I, I bet Jesus said that. That sounds good. That's a good Bible verse, this or that. Don't be that guy. Luke gives us such an excellent model to live by that's investigate the claims, know your scripture, really dive in, that Luke dives all in on, I want to know who Jesus is. Is he really real? Luke takes a closer look so he might investigate these claims so he's all in on discovering who Jesus is. And it's obvious that Luke is interested and he cares about the skeptics. He was one of them. Um, you know, he was on the outside. He was the Gentile who came in. He was not raised in, in like Jewish tradition or faith. He was a skeptic. We also see uh, uh, that he's writing to Theophilus, who is more than likely a skeptic as well. And he's trying to encourage him. We also see in the book of Acts that Luke writes when Paul goes to the Bereans, and the Bereans are questioning Paul's uh, theology in, in the scripture. And, and how does Luke describe the Bereans? He describes them as noble men because they sought diligently to, to investigate the scripture. And so we see that Luke cares about those who might have doubts, those who are skeptics. And so if you find yourself here and you say like, I'm kind of a skeptic. I don't know if I know everything. And I wonder, is this really real? Luke cares about you. He wrote the book of Luke for you in mind. And I want you to know that Jesus cares about you as well. So there is real credibility in what we read. The scripture that we have today, this, the Bible that you hold, there's real uh, certainty in the credibility that we have. And you know, I get, get excited to uh, talk about this and I've talked about the many reasons in different forms and fashions before about the credibility, the authenticity of scripture. And I can't get into everything today. And you could get a PhD, you know, uh, in the art of linguists or archaeology or history or theology, all these different things to really know the totality of the authenticity of scripture. But let me just tell you, it is significant. It, it, would, it is many, many years, thousands of years of people's life work that can show the authenticity of scripture. But let me just give you some reasons today to, to know that we can trust the Bible, that we're not blindly stepping into scripture, blindly trusting, but there's a way that we can look at God's word and feel and know that it is uh, uh, credible. We can have certainty in that. So here's just a few reasons. One is how soon it was written and then how soon it was published. So remember, the narrative that, that Luke writes was 30 years after Jesus' death. It was written around 60 AD, which means that the people who were around would have known the story, seen the story. They were, they, they, Luke had uh, uh, in, not interrogated, but he had uh, investigated it. He had talked with people. It also means that there would have been people that had seen it that could have refuted the claims. It was written during a time that it could have been refuted. It was written during people's lives that they were there. Anyone could have refuted it. And there were people like Josephus, who was a Jewish uh, historian at the time, who was not a believer in Jesus. And you see some of his writings as well that corroborate many of these events and stories. That it was written during a time that people could have refuted it. But what we see is that Luke would have had to have been 100% spot on accurate with people's eyewitness accounts. And you, do you know the importance of an eyewitness account? You know, the government has set up an entire program called the Witness Protection Program that has housed almost 20,000 people because eyewitness accounts, one eyewitness account is that important in a court of law, one. And what we see is Luke take this whole conglomeration of a multitude of eyewitness accounts that he wrote it and it was distributed during the time, the exact time that anyone could have refuted it. But it spread like wildfire because of the detail and the accuracy and it appealed to the common knowledge of Jesus. That it appealed to those who had just said their story, the common knowledge. 
It spread while anyone could refute it. Um, we also see that, that um, Luke writes this about Paul when he's appealing to Festus when he's uh, imprisoned. This is what Luke records Paul said to the king. He says, for the king knows about these things. And to him I speak boldly, for I am persuaded that none of these things have escaped his notice. Paul is saying the king knows about this. It has gone around. These are events and things that people know about and gone around. And he says, for this has not been done in a corner. Meaning that no one, Luke did not write this book, the book of Luke or Acts or the other gospels over in this corner in a dark room and then brought it out and was like, hey, we have something from the Lord. Like, let's read it because, and it's real. He's saying it was not done over in a corner. It was done by eyewitness accounts going and talking to the people, recording an act accurate and orderly event. So the one skeptic to another skeptic, here is the accurate detail of Jesus. That in that time, when it was, could anyone could have refuted it, it would have had the most amount of scrutiny to become a historical document. We also have certainty of how readily uh, Luke exposes incidents that fictional authors would have never concealed or would have definitely concealed. They would have most, most certainly concealed. Winston, Winston Churchill uh, said it this way, history is written by the victors, right? So when you win a war, you get to say how much courage we had, and we had so much boldness riding into battle, and we des devised the greatest plan, and we, we, you know, this, that, it's all about us. And so much of scripture is written by people who speak so lowly of themselves. Now this is really important because why would someone do this if they were trying to sell a myth? Why would someone talk about their, their real character or their, their real human nature if they were trying to sell a myth? It makes no sense to talk about Peter's denial of Jesus. It makes no sense. It makes no sense to talk about the apostles' competition with one another about seeing who would have a higher place in the kingdom of God. It makes no sense to talk about the apostles' abandoning of Jesus in his greatest time of need. It makes no sense to, for the apostles, to talk about the apostles' lack of faith in G many of Jesus' miracles. To be included, no one would do this other than someone trying to create an exact, accurate, orderly event. And we can have certainty in its accurate account. And this doesn't take into account at all the amount of of uh, historical manuscripts we have of the Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament alone, over 25,000 historical manuscripts. That is unheard of. There is no uh, record, document, book on this planet that even scratches close to come close to that. Nowhere. I think Homer is the next and it has about 600 manuscripts. There's nothing that even comes close to the 25,000 thousand dating all the way back to things like the great Isaiah scroll that they bring out in the Jewish antiqu antiquities um, uh, um, once a year over in Jerusalem. And it's like dates back to like 600 BC. Like no book or record has this amount of manuscripts that you can cross, uh, examine, and corroborate the different events. And was it written accurately? Like it's just, as you look into this, it's just unfathomable the amount of history and work that has been placed in the Bible and the scrutiny that the Bible has uh, withstood over thousands of years. When we're seeking certainty and authenticity, it doesn't take the guts out of faith. When sometimes you may have been raised in a place that says if you ask questions or you investigate, that means you have a lack of faith. Not true whatsoever. It is not a sin to investigate, to desire clarity, to research or ask questions. Rather, on the other hand, investigation provides you more things to worship. As you uh, investigate who Jesus is, uh, the claims that he made about himself, and you investigate the, bu the Bible, it gives you more reason to worship. You will know more of the character of God and it will turn your heart to worship him. This is why David wrote in Psalm 119, with my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. For I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Studying the word of God brings a heart of worship. Seeking certainty is not wishful thinking. Real faith is meaningful. This is what faith is. The writer of Hebrews writes in chapter 11, he says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. 
So what do we hope for? We're not talking about hoping in like gaining a bunch of stuff, a nice car, a nice job. If that happens, that's great. But those aren't the things we hope for because God never promised those to us. We don't hope in the stuff because it wasn't promised, but we hope for and in the fulfillment of the gospel and the promises that God made us. That is the hope that we have and we receive. So these are the things. See, these are some of the things that we might hope in. First John 2, 25 says, and this is the promise that he made us, eternal life. Second Corinthians, Paul writes in chapter one, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who, who are in, in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. God is our comforter. We can hope in that. This is the promise that he's given us. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He's faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. That is what faith is. It is not blind faith. Faith says, even though I cannot see God, I believe that he will remain consistent to his character. Faith is not a blind leap into the dark. Faith is an informed leap into the light. Now let me be really clear about that one more time because sometimes we get that backwards. Faith is not a blind leap into the dark. Faith is an informed leap into the light. That is what real faith is, which means that when we get informed, it's not so that we can get puffed up and have this posture of I know everything. It's so we can have a posture of worship and that we can actually hope in the things that we know about. So what does certainty and this credibility, credibility means? It means this, what is written in this book is true and you can trust it. So that means that that informed leap into the light means that in spite of things that happen in our world, when we go through hard, hard times, we can say, God, I know your word says you'll comfort me. So I trust you. I trust you that you will provide comfort. I know that you say, do not worry, and that I should come to you in prayer when I feel anxious. So I'm gonna come to you and pray and know that you're with me. You're just right here. It means that when, he, when Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy, heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. It means that you go to him and you say, Lord, I trust you that you're here for me and, I, and that you can give me rest in this time of need. There's real certainty through the credibility of the scripture that we can hold on to. Now, I just wanna encourage you, if you're a skeptic in this room, don't let this be the only word that you have from here. Investigate the claims. Do the work. Ask the questions. Do the research. It's good. It's okay. And I believe God will reveal himself to you. All right, second thing we can have certainty in is through community, certainty through community. Here's what Luke writes again. He's saying, it seemed good to me also, right? He's like, I thought this was a good idea too, probably because Luke was a little skeptical about some of the claims. It seemed good to me also, having followed all the things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. So remember, that's probably one skeptic to another. And the scene is, is that here's this guy, probably on the outside of the community looking in. Theophilus, he was a Gentile. He was not born a Jewish man. He was most likely a Roman officer. So it's this Greek man, possibly, you know, the Roman official. And he's asking these questions on the outside looking in. And maybe you found yourself there before as well. You're on the outside looking in, wondering if this was really for me. And, and he's saying, you know, uh, is Jesus really real? And he's asking, as someone on the outside who wasn't born and raised and did all the things, am I really included in all that? Am I really included in what you're saying? Have you ever asked this yourself before? As you look around and as you think about, have you been a part of, you know, your faith for years and then something just begins to happen in your heart and you just wonder like, am I really included in that? Is that really for me still? Does God really want me apart? Maybe you've asked that same question that probably Theophilus was asking. Like, as the, as the outsider looking in, is that really for me? Even if you've been in the church for a long time, your heart can change and go like, am I really included in this community, in this family? Is that really what God has for me? And then what we see is that Luke provides an orderly account, and an account that's not chronological, but it's thematic, meaning that it's theme-based. 
that not everything that happens in the book of Luke is in a chronological order, but it paints this picture by speaking with social outcasts in society that they usually would not care about, that he demonstrates through the ministry of Jesus that all these social outcasts that Jesus spent time with, foreigners, um, those who were alienated, women, children, more than any other gospel, we see Jesus speaking with these people in the book of Luke. That Luke is saying that with all these people, if they're included, you're included as well. As Theophilus, maybe as a Roman person high up in this order thinking like, my people killed Jesus. Am I really included in that? And maybe you've thought that, like you've done stuff against the Lord. Am I really included? Luke's response is, look who's included throughout the book of Luke. Look who's included, which also means that you are included. Uh, the, the book called The Bible for Dummies, if you know that series for Dummies series, The Bible for Dummies, it is not a biblical commentary by any stretch of the imagination, okay? But I love how uh, in it, it summarizes the book of Luke. His, here's basically how it summarizes the book of Luke. Jesus is for everyone. I love that. I think that works. Jesus is for everyone. That's what the book of Luke is. The work of Luke does this incredible job to show how Jesus reaches the marginalized, the disenfranchised, the alienated, those who are religious, those who are sinful, women, children, those who have physical ailments, spiritual ailments, mental ailments, emotional ailments. That We see Jesus reach into all these people and wrap his arms around in this, this theology of inclusivity is seen all throughout the book of Luke and Acts. It says Jesus is for everyone. You are included. You are included. And a couple of these times, we won't, might not be able to see all these stories throughout the book of Luke uh, in this series, but um, we see multiple different times. One of them is when Jesus goes and has uh, this meal with this Pharisee, Simon. Simon did not like Jesus. And we see Jesus come in and it was customary during that time to wash your guest's feet as they come in. And Simon doesn't do this. More than likely because he didn't like Jesus and he was seeking to discredit Jesus and his position that he was gaining. And he's sitting at this table and this woman sneaks her way in. And this would not have been religious custom at all and definitely not social custom to invite a woman into this meal at that time especially a woman that's, that uh, Luke depicts as a sinful woman. It would not have been customary. But this woman makes her way in and she ends up sitting at the feet of Jesus. And maybe you've heard this story before, but she begins to wash Jesus' feet with this perfume she brings and with the tears that's streaming down and with her hair. And she's washing this, the feet of Jesus. And Simon asks her, like, are you really gonna let this woman, this sinful woman, wash your feet? And here we see, as someone who's an outsider, who was not included at all in this meal, not included in the religious system, who was sinful, Jesus turns to her and he, or first he talks to Simon and then he turns to this woman and basically tells her, your sins are forgiven and you are blessed. And we see how Jesus includes those. Another story is maybe you remember the story where uh, the, all the little children run up to Jesus and like sit on his lap. Or maybe you've seen the painting before. You remember this story? If you haven't, what happens is all these little children come up and the disciples try and sh like shoo the children away. But the thing is, is during uh, this biblical era in these times and this uh, society, children were, had zero social status. Today, we love children, right? Children are wonderful in our society. We love them. We care for them. In these times, children had zero social status. They had none. In an honor-shame society, they just didn't have any. And, and, and what also, uh, what happened is during this time, if you didn't want your child, especially in Roman culture, if you didn't want your child, you could give it away. You could give it away to become a gladiator and it'd probably die. You could give it away and sell it into prostitution or a slave. You could just give it away and become an orphan. This was uh, uh, what could take place in the society. And beggars on the outside of the city gates would actually leverage children who were given away to gain more money from people. And so more than likely, the children that came to Jesus on that story that Luke depicts were outsiders. They were children who were tossed away, given away, wandering around in a pack together. And they go up to Jesus and why the, the disciples see, and they know they live in this society, they get it. And they're like, hey, this isn't a good look for you, Jesus. Like these are outsiders outsiders and maybe you know and you remember what he says but Jesus says what let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to them so what is Luke saying here 
Luke is saying, yes, that the children belong to God, but also the children represent the outcast, the marginalized, those who were not included. And he says, they are welcome. Jesus turns society on its head. It doesn't matter your profession, your resume, your age, your gender. You are included. You can have certainty in the community that Jesus established that you are included in it. This is the invitation of the new community of Jesus, that it's for anyone who will live dependent on the Lord. We are all included in the family of God. And I believe you'll see that throughout the book of Luke as we study it. Lastly, and we're not going to spend a lot of time here, we're going to end on this, but we can also have certainty through the centrality of Christ, the centrality of Christ. And here we see that Luke, is, he's acknowledging that he's adding one voice among others. In verse four, he says that you may have certainty concerning the things that you've been taught. He knows that others have taught, taught these things. He knows he's adding one voice in. But the centrality of Jesus is really key throughout the entire book of Luke that you're going to see that, that ultimately Luke says that Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one. And the centrality of Jesus is the fulfillment of God's relentless plan to draw humanity back to himself, to draw humanity back to him. The book of Genesis through Revelation paints this one picture that there's 40 authors, 66 books, over thousands of years that it gets compiled into what we now call the Bible. And that the same theme, this one central chord that runs through the entire Bible, Genesis to Revelation, points to the person of Jesus that who will be the Messiah and then Jesus as fulfilling prophecy as the Messiah. And that one theme we see all through is this picture of God pursuing his people to bring them back to himself. And it is by way of Jesus that that is accomplished. In the gospel of Luke, Jesus' favorite title to call himself is the son of man. You ever wondered what it means like when Jesus says like the son, I am the son of man, what that means? What it means is first is that Jesus is our representative, that he's the one who represents us um, uh, on our behalf to God, that we needed a representative as sinful people, that this massive wall of sin separates us between us and God. And Jesus is our representative as the son of man. He's our representative who then goes, as he dies on the cross, he pays the punishment of our sin. And what that does is that reconciles, reconciles us back to God. And we now have peace with God through the atonement of Jesus Christ. That we are now um, a part of his family. This also means that he has full authority to be our representative, meaning that he is God. As our representative, he has full authority in that. And it also means that as the son of man, he is fulfilling the prophecies that we see in the Old Testament. One specifically you see in the book of Daniel, where Daniel has this vision of one day that there's this son of man that is uh, in heaven representing humanity. And that as Jesus claims that, he's saying, I am the one who fulfills prophecy. I am the one who represents on your behalf that you might become reconciled back to God, have peace with him, and have eternal life through Jesus. The story of Luke shows the fulfillment of prophecy. And it shows that Jesus fulfills everything that we need so that we can have peace with God. The gospel of Luke is so that you would have certainty. And our great God has made a place for you in his family that you are included and that you can be certain. Would you pray with me? And if you're here and maybe you've never made the decision to follow Christ, today you can have certainty that if you were to die tomorrow, where you would be. That if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. And that you can have certainty in. That your certainty, uh, you can be certain that your eternal state lies with, with God. That you'll spend your, your, uh, the, uh, all of eternity with Jesus. If you've never made that decision, you can be certain today where you will be. As a promise, God made you. So I wanna provide you that opportunity right now if you've never prayed that. Would you just pray with me right now? If, if that's you, just pray this in your own heart. God, I come before you and I do not know everything. But I need you. I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross for me. 
to pay the price of my sin. I ask for your forgiveness. I ask that you would come into my heart, be the Lord and Savior of my life, and I want to follow you all the days of my life. Now, as we're still praying here, if you prayed that prayer here in the room or online, would you just raise your hand saying, I I took the leap into the light today. I made that decision. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're online, there's a button you you can click that say, I made that decision as well. I just want you to know that the Bible says that all of heaven is rejoicing that you have made that decision. So God, we just come before you, ask that you would bless them on their journey of faith and give us a desire to investigate you, to know more about you, that we might have certainty in things that we should and live a life according to what you call us to live. God, we wanna know you. We wanna know your heart. We wanna know your character. Thank you for who you are. And we pray this in your name. Amen.